I'm Jansen Wargrain II. Uh, this is the 28th episode of the Ruby Rogues. Josh Susser is going to be mad at me for saying it like that. He hates that TH on it. So like I said, this is episode 28 of the Ruby Rogues. Um, uh, with me today is Avdi Graham. I am Avdi, and uh, I blog at avdi.org slash devblog.ruby and other development things. Um, uh, also with us today is uh, Dave Copeland. Avdi told me he wanted to uh, talk about Ruby outside of web development today, and so he, you know, was like, uh, we got to find somebody who uses Ruby outside of web development. I actually would have settled for somebody who uses Ruby on anything but a social coupon site. Um, but I found the guy, the one guy, uh, who uses Ruby outside of web development. So Dave Copeland, here you yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Copeland. Uh, there we go. No, not working. Uh, so I'm Dave Copeland, and uh, I'm writing a book about command line applications in Ruby, because I love using Ruby on the command line. That's where I learned it. But I must admit, I do work at Linux Social. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Do over. Um, so, like I said, this is the Ruby Road Safari. I mean, uh, Ruby Beyond Web Development uh, is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we thought we'd chat for about 20 minutes or so. It's pretty short for us. We usually uh, talk for uh, close to 40, but we'll cut it in half because we got. I'm sure you guys want to get lunch eventually. Um, we'll chat for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions, because that's a cool thing we can do when we have a live audience that we don't normally. Oh, which, by the way, for the people listening to the podcast, we really do have 200 of our closest friends in this room with us right now, so make some noise. Prove you're here. We're going to put all of those people on the panel. Okay, so Avdi, tell us what you had in mind when you chose Ruby Beyond Web Development. So uh, when I got started with Ruby, it was it was long before the Rails era, and um, you know there were people doing like CGI scripts and stuff like that with Ruby, but it was still kind of wide open what we were going to use this language for. And actually, a lot of the uses uses um, you know before Rails uh, were kind of in the vein of what you would have done with a Perl script. Uh, only use Ruby instead because Ruby is so much more awesome, and uh, that's some of the stuff that I got started with. So I was, you know, munging files and stuff like that, and and I just got to wondering about, you know, who's still doing um, all kind, you know, interesting stuff beyond the web with Ruby. Gotcha. So, uh, what particular projects have we worked with that uh, were Ruby but not necessarily on the web? Dave, if you want to go first. Um, well, I, I have a uh, still off. I'll just yell. Uh, so I have a similar uh, intro to Ruby as uh, as, as, as Avdi. I uh, you know used to do Perl, and so then I got tired of that, and uh, Ruby was was great for that. Um, and uh, I think Homebrew for me kind of like captures like what's great about Ruby on the command line because it sets up your system. It does all kinds of like crazy stuff that you normally would do with like autoconf or something like that, but it's all in Ruby and it's extensible via object orientation. So it kind of demonstrates for me like you know how great it is to. Do Ruby on the command line. So the the first thing that I I, I recall doing that uh, was like part of my job. It wasn't just playing around. Um, was I, I wrote a program for processing prom images? Which does that even ring a? How many people does that actually ring a bell for in this room? There's one hand. There's a couple. Uh, a couple of hands. Okay. So so back before. Um, all devices had flash memory on them and USB ports and, and cool stuff like that. Um, you, you used to have devices that the only way to reprogram them was to actually take a chip off the board. It was made to be pried off the board. And you would put it in this special prom burner machine. And you would load up a prom image that you had prepared of the program that was supposed to be running on this device. And you would, you would hit go on the prom burner. And it would sit there for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. Uh, doing its thing, and then you'd pull the, the chip off, and you'd carefully label it, and then you you jam it into the into the board. And uh, and I was working on an old radar system that that you still had to program with these proms. And there was this horrible prom uh, pre-processing program that you had to use that would get all the the memory segments in exactly the right locations in this prom image. And it was it was this nasty old C program that was 
that was so legacy that parts of it were just like a compiled object file that nobody had the source code for or the compiler for anymore. And, uh, and so you just had to link with that because you, there was no way to, to, to change it. Um, and, and so I, I thought, you know, we're, we're rapidly iterating on a new version of this hardware. We keep having to move things around in memory. And if I have to keep modifying this stupid C program, I'm going to go insane. So I basically just rewrote the parts of it that I actually needed in Ruby and just use, using its, its ability, like pack and unpack, to, to, um, to fiddle with, with memory uh, and, and to, to do binary um, layouts. And, uh, and that, was, that was it. I wrote this uh, prom preprocessor, which would, which would sort of munch the prom images in the way that, that uh, the device needed. Um, so I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that I've been thinking the whole time of ideas I could bring up, projects that I've used Ruby for, and uh, it wasn't web development. And some of my greatest idea have, ideas have happened in the last 10 minutes because people have reminded me of them. <laughs> so obviously talk about uh, prom imaging. Um, this chair right here, when I got this new chair, uh, they showed me that you can stick an uh, SD card in the side of the controller and it'll write out the programming on the chair onto this SD card in this binary format, and then they can take it and reprogram it. They should have never showed me that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I used Ruby, and I uh, reverse engineered the binary format that it stores its programs in, and you know, I would sit there and manipulate settings to see what effect they would have and stuff like that. So you can actually reprogram your wheelchair with Ruby if you want to, just FYI. <laughs> uh, not recommended, although I have thought about doing a training where I invite students to do that and then run their program, but I think it could be dangerous. <laughs> Not true. Um, so uh, that's one use. Then, uh, I, as some of you probably know, I do quite a bit of work with TextMate uh, and, and working with that team. Uh, and it completely skipped my mind uh, until Dr. Nick reminded me about two minutes before we uh, came up here to do this. Uh, then we use Ruby all over the place in TextMate. Uh, all the bundles use, uh, make heavy use of Ruby. Uh, so that's another example of it. Finally, uh, one of the projects I'm working on uh, right now is a simulation for a uh, vaccination company. They're testing several new vaccinations, and they want to show the effects of different vaccinations on populations. So they simulate populations. They introduce viruses and infections and stuff and, and run those through. Uh, and then they introduce vaccines and screening and things like that to show the effects of vaccinations on the population. So uh, that's one of the cooler projects I've worked on that is using Ruby in a totally uh, non-web environment. It has some interesting challenges. Uh, first of all, it's really cool to write a simulation in Ruby because it models it so well with the great object system and stuff like that. Uh, but of course, as we all know, Ruby's not the fastest uh, thing in the planet. Uh, so uh, when we're doing very large numbers, simulating very large populations, we sometimes have to get a little creative with that algorithms and uh, memory usage to make it more friendly. So, but I like that because I get to try new stuff, and so I enjoy that too. Uh, so, so those are some of the uses I've had in mind. So Dave, aren't you kind of writing a book about using Ruby in non-web situations? In fact, I, uh, in fact, I am. Um, and I was inspired by writing a program similar to what the two of you have been talking about. I had to, uh, I worked at a, a company before that um, generated uh, lots of PDFs that got mailed out to people. And the QA was, um, we would email out like a 10,000 page PDF and everyone in the company would go through it looking for problems. Um, so. Uh, instead of that, what I did is I wrote a Ruby script that would go in and do some boundary value analysis on the data and produce PDFs only for people who kind of fit in uh, the certain categories of weird data. And then you only had to look at, like, say, 100 PDFs instead of 10,000. Um, so after doing a really terrible job of writing that program and having it come back to bite me in the ass later, I decided to redouble my efforts and learn how to, like, really, really write a good command line program. And um, I found that uh, I thought I had, like, a whole book's worth of stuff. To, uh, to write about that. So um, we've been working on that for the past year for the uh, Pragmatic Programmers. So what is your book called? What, uh, it is called Build Awesome Command Line Applications in Ruby. And uh, I gave them the out to not use the word awesome. I thought it was a little hyperbolic, but um, they were cool with it. So yeah. Well, I think it's awesome. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
in that chapter, you're gonna, or in that book, you're going to cover all the different, uh, like, are you just going to cover uh, techniques in the Ruby language? Are you also going to cover some uh, libraries like Thor that usually get used for that task? Right? Yeah, so I tried to keep it um, not as a, a bunch of instructions for libraries and sort of concentrate on, like, what is the gist of how to interact with the system and with the users and what you want your applications to do. Um, but there is uh, some of that stuff, so like option parser, um, things like that, and then there's going to be an appendix that basically shows the example programs using a couple different um, command line parsers, just so you can kind of, you know, in Ruby there's like ten ways to do everything, whichever way you feel comfortable, and so, you know, I like to demonstrate all those things at least. Very cool. What what would you say makes Ruby particularly handy for the that kind of command line work? Yeah, I think it's because it's a high-level language that has all these great abstractions like object orientation and all this metaprogramming where you do really powerful things, but you're still really close to the really close to the metal and can run system commands, access you know the Unix system, um, you know stuff like file utils lets you write uh, what looks like a Bash script, but it's still Ruby, so you get kind of the best of both worlds. It's a really good point. So we did some asking around uh, on the internet too. Uh, we've just heard about this technology stuff, and it's so cool. Um, so we did some asking of what other people are using Ruby for in non-web scenarios, and we got some cool answers. So uh, let's hear what some other people are using it for. Let's see here. So um, uh, Ava Howard did some work with uh, at NOAA for processing satellite imagery. I, I actually know in that particular case. I used to work with Ava from time to time, and. Um, uh, in that particular case, I believe he was uh, analyzing uh, satellite images from Hurricane Katrina uh, and uh, doing the processing with uh, Ruby's image libraries and stuff to uh, detect things like power outages and stuff like that. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, Chris Umble writes, we use JRuby in a control system for a robotic tape library. Uh, Tim Pease has used uh, used Ruby at uh, an aerospace company to validate test imagery for the Kepler Space Telescope. Cool. There's some other uh, mentions of, of NASA related work. NASA does use uh, Ruby quite a bit. Um, Bill Klebb uh, has been in the community more so in the past, I think, than uh, current days, and he's a NASA employee and always using uh, Ruby for all kinds of awesome avenues in NASA. There is a uh, Ruby interface to Arduino. That's true. Just, you guys make Arduino projects? No, nobody. Um, homework. You guys have homework. <laughs> Seriously. Do you want to briefly explain what that is? Sure. It's a uh, um, like for hardware hacking, right? If we do the software side, the Arduino boards are, are circuit boards that. Uh, you know, make it easy to uh, hack into all kinds of things, uh, and you can find recipes online. There are awesome sites with just unbelievable things you can build from uh, cool fountains that have lights in them that oscillate in cool patterns to uh, old-style uh, gaming cabinets, you know, with the, uh, then you put hardware in there that you can write software on and stuff, so uh, really neat stuff, kind of a neat combination of uh, hardware and software. And then there are some mentions of some other uh, command line stuff, like a uh, earthquake, a command line Twitter client, um, and of course there's there's sysadmin stuff. So both both Chef and uh, Puppet use Ruby. Yeah, that's a good point. Ruby seems kind of slow to get into the sysadmin side of things as far as like Perl's penetration, but then Chef and Ruby, I think, did turn the tables. I might give some exposure. I feel like like uh, Ruby is is maybe the the perfect sys administration language because you can take a script from like the messiest one liner, uh, which works and works you know like one liners in Ruby, and then it gives you this really nice gradual um, series of steps where you can make that more and more general uh, and more and more you know nicely factored and abstract as you add things like classes and modules and 
you had a, a proper option parser instead of something hacky with RD. <coughs> And, uh, and then you can start factoring files out of it and you can keep the whole thing under test. And it's just a really nice, you know, other languages, it's like it's really nice for those one-liners or it's really nice for those, those high-level programs. But Ruby, you get to have all of the steps in between. Yeah, I, uh, I tried convincing the sysadmins at my last job about that. Um, they're really into Bash so much that the lead sysadmin schedules four hours every Friday afternoon for Bashing time. And it's on his calendar, and he just writes bash scripts. And uh, when he heard I was writing this book, he like he redoubled his efforts to like really learn bash and show me how awesome it was. And uh, I'm just gonna give him a free copy of the book and see see if it changes his mind. Awesome. I use Ruby a lot, and uh, just my day to day work. You know, I, I think we um, always end up doing some kind of introspection on something, and and uh, with servers and stuff. And, and I'm so-so with the command line, mediocre with bash, and I, I know the tools like grep and, and stuff, of course, that we all use for that, but it, it, the second I get out of my comfort zone, I immediately default to just using Ruby, uh, and I'll write a <coughs> one-line script, and uh, I use the flip-flop operator, I'm sorry, Ola. Um, so uh, I'll write a quick one-line script and, and just, uh, go after the data I'm at, uh, just because I'm so familiar with it and stuff. And actually, uh, Speaking of the flip-flop operator, maybe we shouldn't go there, but uh, Ruby has a whole bunch of like really scary features for uh, uh, doing work at the command line, begin and end blocks, uh, the flip-flop operator, rdef, uh, all kinds of things like that. And I really do encourage you to like look into some of those. Uh, if for no other reason that they'll kind of expand your brain a little bit, you'll see Ruby in some ways you never thought you'd see it before, that's for sure. Uh, so, uh, it borrows most of those features from Perl, by the way, so if you came from Perl, you're probably pretty used to a lot of them already. Anything else we need to say about that, or should we just start taking some questions? All right, you guys had some time to think them up, so we expect good ones. Give the hard ones to Dave, Abdi and I will handle the rest. Yes? So, how do you mitigate the cost of forking a brand new Ruby interpreter every single time you use a, something on the command line? Uh, so the question is how do you mitigate the cost of forking a new Ruby every time you use it on the command line? Um, as opposed to, uh, I mean, you're gonna run a command line program, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna fork a process every time, right? So you don't, okay. Well, well I, what's the alternative? Uh, you got a Ruby interpreter over here, and you send your script to send it. Send your script right? to it, yeah, that's, that's interesting, I guess. Um, but I mean, you know, if like you don't CGI with Perl or something. Right, right. If you don't load Active Record, I mean, is the load time really bad? I mean, uh, Ruby starts up and very, very fast, right? I don't use Active Record in my command line scripts a lot. Maybe, maybe J Ruby has a little slower startup, but uh, it's gone faster. Yeah, and that's gotten a lot faster. But MRI, I, I, you know, we need to sit down and time it. But I'm pretty sure it's a sub-second startup. It's very fast. Yeah, it, it's it's a very very fast startup. So that that's not something that worries me too much. But there are a lot of, you know, once you start building your script up, you might start requiring more and more. And one thing I'll say to that is, um, if you don't need, if you don't need all of those libraries for every path that your your script might take, look into using autoload and and only, and only load the uh, the libraries as you need them. Also, check out uh, Ruby 193, which was just released uh, very recently. Um, they applied a patch to it that fixed uh, a big uh, file stat problem they had when loading lots of gems and stuff. Uh, I think in Rails' case in particular, it, it uh, increased the boot time of Rails uh, by a little less than 30%, I think. So they definitely are making big headways there when you are loading massive amounts of numbers. Next question? Way over there. Yeah, so uh, you're running command line programs. What's your uh, for, for, out of the bazillion ways of parsing the command line? Uh, what's your favorite library to do that? So the question is, what's our favorite command line parsing library? I think we can all answer, give our own answers. Uh, mine, I like Option Parser, and then I uh, I wrote one called GLI. So since I wrote it, I like to use it all the time. But it's pretty much like Commander. <laughs> I like Main by Ara T. Howard. Check it out. Main is pretty cool, I agree. It's, uh, it's a cool library I've used a couple times. You usually just use our option parser because uh, it's in the standard library and I do it really well. So. Another question? And that? You mentioned when you 
when you first started writing a script, you felt some pain, you, you looked at your, you didn't like what you'd done. Um, can you give an example or two of what you since learned that you, did, that you did originally that you don't like anymore? Uh, so the question is, what were some of the painful things I did that I didn't like and, and how did I fix them? Um, so, uh, you know, going into argv directly instead of just biting the bullet and using option parser, I mean, that's like the number one offense. Um, and uh, just not formatting the output usefully, um, not, hand, not, not checking error codes, exit codes of things. Um, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it, it's just the worst when someone else is running your program and they get a backtrace. I mean, that's just no excuse for that. I've definitely done things I've uh, regretted on the command line, I'm sure, uh, most of all. Uh, destroying directories and stuff. Uh, usually mine involve having too many permissions that I shouldn't have had when I was running that particular command. Uh, but, you know, definitely be careful. Uh, uh, libraries like uh, File Utils has a dry run mode. I love that mode, uh, where it'll go through and show you everything it's going to do before you actually use it. Really important. That's good. Good stuff. Other questions about using Ruby in non-web scenarios? Back Ruby, right? Desktop apps? I don't do that, but that's a non-web scenario. That is a non-web scenario. That's a good point. And getting more popular with the Mac App Store and stuff. Can you make a Mac Ruby app and submit it to the Mac App Store? I believe you can. That's pretty cool. I believe you can. But we don't see Ruby used as much in desktop environments, do as much is anybody reason. building anything on the desktop? Yes, there's a hand in that. Oh, I know that guy. <laughs> what are you building? So the um, the website for Clean Coders, the video stuff that we're doing is written in Clojure, but the control panel stuff that we use for administrating it is all written in Ruby, and it's a desktop application that we use to put up graphs and and control the site. And we're using uh, the Limelight framework for uh, doing essentially JRuby swing applications driven by Ruby. It's very cool. That is very cool. I believe your son did a talk on that at uh, RubyConf, I yeah, recall. He, yeah, he's the author of Limelight. He did, did a number of talks on that. Yeah, that was very interesting. So it does get used in the desktop environment some, maybe just not as much. As as Anyone else? Sadistic kind of way. <coughs> Fun, developing for Android uh, using Mirror and Panda, you said? Panda. Panda. I've got a question Go for you guys. Um, have you ever tried to apply Ruby to a problem outside the web and said, no, this is a mistake. I'm going to use something else. I think Ruby's pretty bad at lots of hardcore mathematical processing type stuff. Uh, my, the last place I worked, there was an analytics team that uh, tried it because I was, yeah, Ruby's awesome, and they're like, this, we have to go back to Python, sadly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point, although I will say on the mathematical processing side, uh, there's a very underappreciated library called NArray, uh, which basically lets you borrow C's number types and then do massive operations over large sets of them. Uh, and I had one library that was doing some image processing, so it was basically just a cube of numbers uh, that we were churning through, and switching it to any array was just a ridiculous speed up. So uh, it can be good for number processing that way. And James, I believe you did a talk on, on that, right? I talked about it at Lone Star once a while ago. There's a, there's a video up of that. So That's right. There is a on conference. Yes, I see a question in the back. Yeah, um, I want to use Ruby on a Wait, so you're saying soap was a total disaster? <laughs> Did I understand that correctly? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, no, I've definitely felt the pain on exactly that issue that uh, Ruby soap library is uh, just not the same uh, as, you know, in other environments and stuff. 
uh, where they, you know, convicted themselves so much from the wisdom, and it seems uh, it, it does some of that, but also it's all black box, so even when it does some of that, you have no idea what it did do, you know, and trying to figure that out is pretty horrible, so. Um, I kind of agree with the idea of just using like a Java tool for something like that. I've actually used Ruby, this is, it's been a couple of years, but I've used Ruby with the Win32 LA library to automate Excel and PowerPoint on a Windows box. Wow, that's kind of cool. I see the war. So that was, so, so that was, that was um, Win32 uh, OLE to, to like automate Excel to, to spreadsheet? Take, yeah, to take data out of a database and put it into Excel. Um, Actually, I've more recently done one where I'm just taking Ruby, pulling data out of MySQL, and using the spreadsheet gem to just write it into an Excel-compatible file, so I don't have to have a Windows box or a license of Office. But so just to just to report that, uh, or to, to repeat that for the room and for the recording, um, it, it can be easier to to these days it can be easier to just like if you just need to write some Excel data, you can just use the spreadsheet gem to write a file instead of actually automating. Uh, Excel from a from a Windows box. Uh, it's funny because you actually like you gave me flashbacks there, uh, <laughs> and you reminded me of something else I've done with Ruby a long, long time ago, which was exactly that. It was it was driving Excel uh, using Win32 OLE from a Windows machine. I use Ruby for lots of daily data munching needs. If I have some data in some source, I want to spit it out in a different source. It's just the fastest way I know how to do it. I see him way back there. Yeah, this is Jim again. Um, you mentioned Arduino earlier. I don't use Ruby to program the Arduino, but I do use Ruby to build the code that goes in the Arduino. So I totally replace the make files with break files. And in general, anything I build like that, I use Ruby slash break to do that. That guy has an unhealthy life of break. Have you noticed something? <laughs> <laughs> something going on there. <laughs> No, that's a great point. I use Rake for like everything. If you guys haven't uh, really checked out Rake, the thing you never see people using is Rake's uh, file tasks. Those are <laughs> awesome. You can like use a file task and then uh, you know give a block of code needed to build that file when it's not present. Um, so you can just do all kinds of ridiculously cool stuff with that. You should check out Rake's file tasks. Anyone else? Okay. I'm curious about what. Um uh, GUI libraries or frameworks people are using in Ruby. I, I, I think maybe shoes is still around. I don't know what else people are like. The question was about uh, GUI libraries, and uh, our good friend Uncle Bob was talking about Limelight, which is which is one. Um, other than shoes, I don't know what else there is. So there's Cherry and Monkey Bars. Cherry and Monkey Bars. I think they're just making up names. <laughs> 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 yeah, those are uh, Java Swing libraries, right? That's right. Yes. And then, uh, and then, of course, there's the old standards, QT, TK, um, what's the third of that trio? I can't remember now. TK. <laughs> um, uh, QT and TK. QT and TK, the Prags had a short Friday book on uh, QT, I think, a while back. Uh, and it seemed to get a little traction at that point, and then just kind of fall off the map again, I think, because those older kits are kind of a pain in the butt to use or not really, you know, is convenient. Um, shoes is that. I think Steve Klobnik resurrected it and uh, has done a lot of work on it, so uh, it is still around. Uh, the minus there being that I think you're using a forked Ruby interpreter in that case, so there's kind of some penalties for that. Yeah. Oh, okay, I may be wrong. That may be old info. Sorry. So those are the libraries that I know of, but yeah, you know, I, I think probably the swing libraries have the most uptake as far as being used. Yeah. There's, there's Ruby known two bindings as well. But that was the other one I was trying to think of. Painful. Yeah, exactly. Right. All those old libraries. Okay, we'll take one more question and then I've got to let you guys go eat lunch and they'll be mad at me. Yep, in the back again. Um, as far as non-web applications go, there's something else that I don't think you mentioned, uh, mobile development. That's a good point. So uh, what he was saying was uh, mobile development, which was mentioned earlier with Android, but uh, 
uh, mobile development is, uh, you know, obviously a huge uh, thing right now, and, and Ruby does get quite a bit of usage there, thanks to things like Roboto and uh, the aforementioned uh, Android libraries. So. All right, thanks. Have lunch. <laughs>